The first innovation in coding a lock that we're going to explore is called Test and Test and Set Lock, or TTSL for short. The idea is that we busy wait with ordinary read operations instead of test and set. And then the cache lock variable will be invalidated when a release occurs, and so at that point we'll fetch it again and maybe the value will change to zero. If it is zero now, we can try to obtain it with test and set. At this point, only one attempt will succeed. You see, on the first loop, it's possible for multiple threads to find the value zero and then proceed to the second loop. The code for test and set lock and test and test and set lock is below. Notice that the code for test and test and set lock is a little bit longer because it has two loops at the prelude rather than one. Other than that, it's essentially identical. Now the code that it is the same as test and set lock is highlighted in green. So you see that the only difference really is the prelude that says we'll do a test with an ordinary lock variable. So basically what we did is took the first lock sequence that didn't work, that didn't guarantee mutual exclusion, and plop it onto the front of test and set lock. But you see what it does in this position is it kind of weeds out a lot of the entries to the test and set instruction so that the only time a test and set is done and therefore the only time a write is attempted to that lock variable is if the first loop succeeds, if we get through the first loop finding the value of lock being equal to zero. So that cuts down on a lot of the writes and therefore a lot of the invalidations. Notice that the lock method now contains two loops. What would happen if we removed the second loop? In other words, if we just took this loop out right there and then left in whatever else there was. It shouldn't be too hard to see what we've done is we've just reduced the code to the very first unsuccessful attempt we made at locking. Two threads could load lockvar at the same time and both find it zero and enter the critical section. Here you see a comparison of the traces of test and set lock and test and test and set lock. And notice the TTSL uh, sequence is longer, but it doesn't seem to have so many invalidations. If you look at the transitions from M to I and S to I, those represent block invalidations, and there are, seem to be many fewer of them with test and test and set lock. So now what I'd like you to do for the first quiz is to count the number of bus reads, bus read X's, bus upgrades, and invalidations in test and set lock. And now let's do the same for test and test and set lock. So in summary, we can compare what happens on a successful lock and failed lock acquisition in these two different sequences. In test and test and set lock, a successful acquisition requires two bus transactions, one bus read, to intervene, that is change from state M to state S, a remotely cached block. And then after you acquire that block with read access, you need to upgrade it to get write access, which you need to invalidate all the remote copies. And that's compared with only one transaction for successful lock acquisition and test and set lock. The bus read X will do what a bus read and bus upgrade does. However, with failed acquisition, the only transaction you have with TTSL is a bus read to read a copy. That doesn't invalidate anything. After you read the copy, you just loop until the lock becomes free, and then you try test and set. That probably will succeed, but it might not, in which case you've got to come back and do it again. However, with test and set lock, each time you look to see whether the lock is free, you're causing a bus read X. So that really ramps up the bus read X's and causes lots of invalidations and slows down the code.